All right, everybody. Glad to have you here with us tonight as we are uh, diving into our midweek Bible study, still in the book of Romans, uh, getting into chapter 7 tonight. Um, and, and Paul is just going to really keep working us over uh, with these theological points. And so we're glad to, to be able to discuss this with you guys and to share uh, what we know is true about the Word of God. Uh, I'm glad to have you with us for that. Uh, just uh, some announcements that we've got. Uh, still be Sunday online, 1045. Uh, coming up tomorrow night, uh, this video that we're recording right now on Tuesday will be available. So Wednesday night available for, uh, we're going to start this over because I don't know why I'm talking about that. That's just dumb. Okay. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> All right, everybody, back with you here for another midweek Bible study over Romans. Chapter 7 is where we're going to be at tonight, so go ahead and get your Bibles out, get ready for that. Just uh, some announcements for you. Uh, we have our Wednesday night live um, with our youth uh, youth group. Um, that's tomorrow night at 7 o'clock with Chris Jackson, and uh, I'll be on there as well. So make sure you tune in to that on our One Way Youth Ministries Facebook page. We should have a fun night for you tomorrow uh, on that uh, just some fun, exciting games that we're going to be doing. Uh, then, you you know, our the Bible study is going to be available to you. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, on uh, Sunday, our online service will be at 1045 uh, once again. And, and we should have all of our technical difficulties worked out so that we don't have to worry about doing Facebook Live or anything for worship during that. Uh, but we are excited to continue to worship with you in this way and continue to try to connect this way. I hope you're connecting with each other in different ways through prayer and phone calls and texts and all those kinds of things. I, I have really enjoyed our Sunday night Zoom um, sessions that we've been able to uh, see each other's faces and, and just have a good time connecting there. Uh, so make sure you're just continuing to do everything that you can uh, to make sure that you're loving on and taking care of uh, the people in our church um, that you know need to be um, taken care of, and uh, hopefully they're taking care of you as well. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll we'll jump on in. So, Marcy, if you could open us up. Lord, we just thank you for this day that you've given to us, and we are just so grateful that we're able to come together and to learn more about you and to read your word and have you reveal yourself to us. And, Lord, we just we just thank you for this opportunity, and we just thank you that we are we are adopted in and. Lord, I just thank you for that. And Lord, I have a, um, these prayer requests from here and uh, people here in Sheraton. I pray that you be with Lauren and his family right now through what they're going through. Um, I pray that you be with Shirley Schmidt's uh, family and all that they're going through right now. Uh, Lord, I pray that you be with the Worthmans, with Bob and Connie, um, that you have your hand on that situation. And with Nathan and Charlotte, and Lord, I just pray that you just have your hand on on each one of these situations and continue to show each and every one of them how much you just you love them and and you're right there with them through all these situations. And Lord, all these any of these situations that involve doctors, I pray that you be with the doctors and guide their hands um, through these situations. And Lord, I just pray that you. Um, you just bring some peace to these some of these situations and and just give them a peace that only you can give. Um, Lord, I just pray that you just continue to work and have your hand in each one of these situations. Yeah, but uh, there's so many things going on in, in people's lives today, and, and I know that in, in Bloomfield and I'm sure in Sheraton as well, there are a lot of even unspoken requests. Um, there have been a few things that have just kind of um, really weighed on some of our church people's lives the last couple of days. And, and God, I just pray for your peace in those in those uh, areas, in those families. Father God, that your, your hand of mercy and grace would just extend out to them right now. Father God, I pray that you would specifically be with um, the brother-in-law of Joanne Mormon uh, and the, the illness that's going through their family. Uh, God, that you just have your hand uh, on there as well. God, continue to be with our frontline workers, those that are, are working uh, to keep us safe, to work on patients that are, uh, whether they're dealing with this virus or, or some other kind of illness. Uh, God, just, 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 just keep them protected. 
Lord God, we love you so much, and we worship you. We praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so we are just going to kind of run through the first um, part of Romans chapter 7. Um, so we're going to go verses 1 through 13. As, um, like RJ said, Paul's kind of continuing to bring these uh, theological points to um, to his argument. Um, so why don't we go ahead and start out there in Romans 7, reading one. Um, why don't we read verses 1 through 6, and then we'll go through that, and then go ahead and read 7 through 13. So, All right, Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 1. It says, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Right. So, um, once again, Paul's kind of starting us out in a question, and he's bringing in uh, this new analogy to us, this marriage analogy. Um, and so then there in, um, that the, uh, in verse 1, that the law has authority over someone only as long as the person lives. So that authority word there, it means like exercising lordship. So the law has exercised lordship over someone only as long as that person lives. Um, and then, so then he makes this, this argument about marriage. And so the first husband... Um, William Greathouse says in the commentary, the first husband is our status within Adam, to whom we are bound under the law. And the new husband is the risen Christ, to whom we are, uni we are united by faith. Um, so as long as the we, meaning the husband, live in the flesh as an old self, we the wife, are governed by the law, which binds him, and therefore ourselves. So he's bringing in this analogy once again, um, kind of bringing it into something that they would have understood at that point of time. Um, if your your first husband's still alive, you're still going to be bound to him. You know, if, if your, hus your first husband dies, so if the old self dies, we are into this new relationship now. I mean, I think it's a good analogy, and again, uh, you know, any of you ladies that are reading this out there, this is not some sort of uh, guideline to get out of your marriage responsibilities, okay? This is not telling you it's okay to murder your husband. Uh, I know that that's probably something that you're all thinking about that. Adam's wiping his brow because he was a little nervous just reading that along with us just now. Uh, but no, this is, yeah, it really is an analogy, as you said. It points out that, uh, you know, what... We are bound to, if 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 it's dead, we're not we're not going to be bound to it anymore, right? We're not we're free from that. So again, ladies, you you understand what he's talking about. If if your husband's gone, you're free from him, and so that's so our goal in this is to be free from that first husband, but we cannot be free from that first husband if that husband has not been killed. If we have not taken our sinful taken our sinful nature out into the backyard like a rabid dog and put it down. That's one sermon and illustration I heard a long time ago that I've just loved. You know, you got you got to take that sin nature outside, put the shotgun to the neck and just put it down. It's got to be done and over with and dead 
so that we can be able to be bound to our new husband, right? Mm -hmm. And to, to even get our new husband. Like, we can't get the new husband if we're still connected to the old one. And so I think that's it's a really good analogy. It just it takes a while to, to bring that out. And if you're not if you don't know what you're looking at there, that's a big that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there, um, Paul kind of brings this analogy about there in in uh, verse four. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law th through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another to him who was raised from the dead. Um, and I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to kind of go back just a little bit. And you also died. So that word that's there for the died actually means you were put to death or you were killed. You also were killed to the law through the body of Christ. Um, so that's that, that's kind of that image there, you know, and, and he... Um, William Greathouse said it's kind of that that image of the crucifixion. Um, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. So um, he was saying it's kind of that, that image of the crucifixion, that you were killed as well. Like, and, and he brought up, you know, the Eucharist, that we kind of, we go into that, um, you know, that, that image. And uh, he even talked about, you know, the baptism, uh, just, you know, the yep. few chapters ago or last chapter it might have been. Um, so it, sa it said in the um, commentary, Christ's crucifixion brought an end to the old humanity in the old age through the body of Christ. And our death is specifically to the law. You also died to the law through the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I, I pulled out a quote that he had in there in the commentary. Is as Paul's point is that Christ's death brought an end to the old age. With it, the distinction between Jews and Gentiles imposed by the Mosaic law also came to an end. All humanity stands on level ground at the foot of the cross. All are sinners, therefore, all must be justified by faith. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's a good, so it gets kind of weird here. We're talking about uh, death and, 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 you know, this idea of, of uh, dying to, or dying to the law through the body of Christ. So again, it's it's ourselves identifying with Christ, or as we've used, I've used the word I think the last few weeks, participating with Christ in His death, so that we can be raised to life in the same way that He is. And so I think that's that's kind of the big that big point there um, is that without Jesus Christ's death, we aren't able to join in with Him. Then also, so it's through His death that we're able to die to the law. Uh, before Jesus Christ died, they were bound to that law. Mm -hmm. But now that Jesus has come, that death to the law is possible. And we've got to participate with Jesus in that mm -hmm. so that we can be raised to life, as, then as the end of that verse says, in order to bear fruit for God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another point they said, er, they're kind of in, in the last part of, of um verse 4, I was going to say chapter, and it's not the chapter, <laughs> um, is death to our old self set us free to commit our lives fully to another, mm -hmm. Christ, and free for one purpose, and it says that there at the very end of that verse, in order that we might bear fruit to God. The fruit or benefit, as we discussed that last um, chapter, um, so the fruit or benefit of wholehearted service to God is the life of sanctification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a, I liked that, the way it worded that uh, there from the commentary. Like I, I think too, I just want, so you've got that comment in there, the, the death of our old self sets us free to commit our lives fully to another. 
So like when we're, if we're not committed to Christ and, and committed to him through his death, you know, to the law and his death on the cross, and we're identifying with him in that, meaning we've got to die to the law also. We can only do that through Jesus Christ. But if we're still bound to the law, if we're just trying to follow the law perfectly, we are not able to commit ourselves fully to Jesus Christ and, and therefore to God. We don't have the relationship that, with God that we need to have if we are still just trying to follow the law. And so many of us, especially those that maybe that have grown up in the church their whole lives, uh, you, you kind of get just, to, you become a rule follower. And some of us, just by nature, not, not uh, I shouldn't say some of us, because this is not me, but some of you out there are just rule followers by nature. You just, you, you, if you, you need a set of rules, you love a checklist. And so if you can just follow that, you're good. But this is telling us that it's about the relationship with Jesus, the participation with Jesus through his death in order that we might bear fruit to God. So we, we've got to get past this checklist mindset, past this uh, uh, rule following mindset in order to focus on the relationship with Jesus Christ that we need to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, there in verse 5, for when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us. So we bore f the fruit of for death. Um, so and then there that that flesh, um, something that we kind of brought up a few weeks ago, um, that flesh. And so Paul talks about several times in you know the flesh. And so um, Grace Greathouse said in his commentary, said um, them translating this word flesh is um, this translation from flesh shows that the, the more the reformed evangelical bias of the NIV. And so he said that, yes, we can trans translate it flesh, but really like what they were meaning um, was to orient our lives around the created order rather than to acknowledge our ongoing dependence on the creator. Um, and then he went on to kind of say, um, passions like desires are not evil per se. It is the sinful end of a human passion that perverts them. So being fl of flesh and having desires isn't necessarily the a sinful thing. Um, it's it's really what we do with those with those thoughts and desires that kind of um, bring about that. Um, but being flesh and blood is not sinful in itself. Um, so then it goes on there, and the fruit of death. So we've talked about the fruit and the benefits of, you know, life with God. And, um, and then he brings us back around. Uh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit of death. Um, the inevitable consequence of allowing the law to assume the rightful throne of God. Um, and then he went on to say, you know, we will bear fruit to God or fruit for death. We cannot choose to be childless. Um, in that whole analogy there of marriage and, you know, we will bear fruit one way or the other. I mean, it goes back to our discussion, too, of being the, the weapons mm -hmm. uh, of righteousness or the weapons of sin. So we're the weapons of, of righteousness that... That, that are part of God's army or weapons of sin that's going against uh, God and his kingdom. And so it's, it's, it's one or the other. You're either going to bear fruit uh, for death, which just means you might have a good life. You might, you might have good, good things happen in your life, but if it's not after the relationship with God that he is calling us to, it will not end with eternal life in heaven for you. Um, and so that's where, so our fruit, the fruit that we bear has to be from God himself, has to be uh, the fruit of a life following after him in his way. And that could even mean that you have an awful life by the worldly standards, but the fruit that you bear 
uh, is something that that always gets gets is able to be seen as coming from God or uh, is being fulfilled by God or or the 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 touch of your life on other people as as has a benefit to them of being touched by God. There's there's just something in there that's it's one or the other, and this 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 myth of middle ground um, that we can just we can just be comfortable and and follow this middle ground is just not the case. And it's a lie of the devil. And so we feel like there's middle ground. Mm-hmm. We feel like there is absolutely is is like I can go to church. I can show up on Sundays. I can I can I can you know maybe teach a class. I can I can help clean the church. I can I can give my money uh, as I feel comfortable to. Um, but that comfortability is a lie of the devil. And it's if you don't have an actual relationship with Jesus Christ, that's producing the fruit of God out of you. And that's 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 the fruit of the spirit for sure, and then just the 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 ongoing ramifications of having a relationship with Jesus Christ is other people will come to know Jesus Christ because of you, and so that, if you don't have that, then what you have is the fruit that you do have is fruit for death, mm-hmm. and that's that's a, that's a scary position to be in if you are someone who thinks you're where you're okay, you're okay with God. I do I do enough we're called to be radical followers of Jesus Christ. And, and so fruit for God is not comfortable living. That's so it could, could mean a lot of things outside of that. But it's, if you just, if you found a comfortable way to attend church and uh, live your life in that way, that's not what he's about. So I might be going off track for you. Sorry. That's no, you're right. You're right. Leading. Yep. Um, so yeah, it basically, he's just putting, you know what we've discussed the last couple of weeks in a different in a different light still basically saying the same thing like we can't just find the middle the middle way like we just we can't there's no middle way in this in this instance we can either bear fruit for god or fruit for death um so going on now to verse 6 but now and so like we need to think about that n- now but now, um, it's like he's, he's saying by participating in Christ by faith, we find ourselves ushered into this age of fulfillment. So we're talking, he's talking in this instance right now. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. I have that underlined. I loved how he put that, serve in a new way of the spirit. And I found this, um, another great quote from Great House in, in the commentary. He said, we abandon allegiance to the enslaving powers of the old age to experience the power of the new age of freedom. But our newfound freedom is not to be confused with autonomy, I even have it written out, and I'm going to freeze as soon as I get to that word, as if we are free to do whatever we please. We are freed from slavery to the law for one purpose, to serve as slaves in the newness of the spirit. I, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a weird way of thinking about that. Like We think, well, freedom means I can do whatever I want. And the reality is, if you th- if you want to just do whatever you want, you will be bound by the consequences of those choices. But if you will live within the the confines of righteousness, <laughs> you will find freedom like you've never experienced before. And you can't experience it. You can't understand what we're talking about until you give it a try, right? Like, and so I want to encourage you to, to 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 don't don't think of freedom to do just whatever you want. Think of freedom as being able to live according to the Spirit and let Him show you what He wants you to do. Let, let the Spirit work in your heart in such a way that, that you can actually say, this is what God wants me to do, and if I do that, I experience freedom like I've never felt before. So, yeah, I think that's good. To, 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 we're freed from slavery to the law so that we can actually be slaves to the Spirit. And that's just, that's good. That's, and it's right. And you can say, I don't want to be a slave to anybody. I promise you, being a slave to the Holy Spirit of God is actual freedom. But you have to give it a try if you want to experience it. So. Right, right. Yep. 
So let's go ahead and go on there. And um, let's read verses 7 through 13. Uh, chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what co uh, coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Right. So, once again, uh, Paul's starting out with another, with another one of those rhetorical questions. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Um, and so in that verse, he's referring back to, you know, one of the verses we talked about in Romans uh, chapter 3. So 320, uh, through the law, we became conscious of sin. So he's kind of bringing back to that point. Um, I w nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. Um, and then... Paul gets into um, into this argument, like he talks about um, he talks about I, or he uses the word you know I as himself, um, but it's not really how uh, Saul the Saul the Pharisee saw himself then, but how Paul the Christian mm -hmm. came to see his former life. Later, So this isn't really something that he's really going through right at this time. It's him reflecting back on um, who he was um, now that he's Paul and a Christian. Um, but we can also say that this is not just simply Paul's story in this. Right. Yeah, this is definitely the experience for all of, all of us, uh, all, all of humanity. As we read this section and, and this through verse 7 through 13, and then next week as we get into the rest of the chapter, for sure, this is still uh, Paul's experience um, of his of his going through uh, the Damascus Road experience of being saved um, by Jesus, of his learning, um, some of these points that he's going to be making to us and how uh, the law has influenced his life and how he sees the law now as a follower of Jesus Christ um, and being dead to the law. When he was once, when he was Saul, he was bound to that law. So again, it shows to show you. And then, you know, as I know we're going to get into some of this stuff a little bit later, but uh, as we get into this, uh, something can be good and still not godly. And so the law is good. And, and it comes out right there in verse 12 and says it. The law is holy. And the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. But yet we need to die to it and live in the, in the, in the way of the Spirit. Um, and so that's... That's a big distinction there. And so when you read through this passage, read through it, understanding this is Paul's experience. He's trying to explain what he understands and what he went through. And you can put yourself into that same experience as well. Uh, and so, so just for example, to start off that verse, you know, wherever verse 8's at, uh, but, or sorry, go into even in verse 7. Uh, Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. I wouldn't have known, you wouldn't have known what sin was unless there was the Word of God telling us what sin is. Uh, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had said, you shall not covet. Um, and so that's, it really comes down to our experience as well, what we see in this. So every time you see the word I, put your name in there. Like this is, this is your experience as well, or what should be your experience as you are coming closer and closer to a relationship with Jesus Christ if you don't have one yet. So. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in there, um, just kind of thinking still about verse 7, um, 
when he's kind of bringing us into this uh, argument uh, again, um, I William Greathouse said in the commentary, and I just I love the way he put it. He said the law turns transparent sin into visible transgressions. Um, and then he went on to say the law stirs up illicit desires. This desire is precisely the exaltation of the ego, which is the essence of sin. I just loved how he put that. That law turns transparent sin into visible transgression. I, yeah, I mean, it, what Paul says in Galatians is that the acts of the flesh are, are obvious, mm -hmm. right? So sin, it's just this like out there, you know, thing, sin, whatever that is. But when we start to allow sin to work in our lives, it becomes visible. Mm -hmm. And it's a transgression against the known law of God. So it's, it's obvious. The acts of the flesh are obvious. The acts of sin are obvious. And, and it does, what, what Great House went on to say, you know, what, what we want starts to come out of us. Mm -hmm. if, if sin, is, if we're still bound to the law, if we're still bound to sin, whichever way you want to look at that, if, we are, if we're still bound to our first husband and not to Jesus Christ, our new husband, then, then we absolutely, what we want will come out of us, right, mm -hmm. rather than what Jesus has for us. Mm -hmm. So, there in verse 8, But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. And so, it was kind of brought up, that, like, this was um, kind of when Paul's talking about this, and uh, once again, you know, this is Paul's experience, but it's also our experience, but they said that Paul is, had like this competitive zeal to surpass his contemporaries in law observance. Even the pursuit of religious ends can produce perverse resu results. So it was good for him to want to, you know, observe the law, but he turned it into a competition. So even these good things that we could do. Um, sometimes we can tend to pervert these things. Um, and, you know, he basically said there, sin deceived me and produced from something neutral something evil. Um, in there, too, uh, for apart from the law, sin was dead. So that, that word there that was used for dead, it was ineffective or powerless and incapable of achieving its object um, for apart from the law sin was dead and then um, did you have anything to well I was just, I was trying to th process through through that um, you know, well, let's go back. so you know you talked about the, the Paul's what he could have meant by his coveting Part, and that's, you know, he was trying to surpass his contemporaries. He was trying to make himself the best. I've always read that as just the coveting there was just an example he was using. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really a specific thing that he was thinking about. Like, you could put any sin in there. Mm -hmm. And, like, I wouldn't have known what, what lying was until the law told me what yeah. it was. I wouldn't know mm -hmm. what sexual immorality was until the law came and told me what sexual immorality I wouldn't know whatever sin is in there. So I'm trying to think through. So, like, is it important? to know what exactly Paul is, is dealing with in his own mind there. And I think it, it can be. Um, but I think, again, the, the biggest takeaway from this has to be putting ourselves into yeah. this experience. Yeah. This is, so this is Paul's experience, but it, it needs to be all of our experience. So mm -hmm. whatever it is for you that, man, the Bible has made it plain and clear to you that this is wrong or this is sin, that's, man, hold on to that. Like, that Paul is clearly, that's, that's been his thing. Like, he's like, man... I got to fight that inside of me all the time, this desire to be better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and so th he's bringing that up. And so for whatever it is for you, I've, you know, I've, I've got this desire to do whatever. If it's from me and not from God, if it's from the world, not from God, then it's, it's not the fruit that we want. It's not going to produce the fruit that we want. And so, and then that last part of that verse, the, for apart from the law, sin was dead. So like, if we don't know, if we don't know that it's against the law, or we don't know what's wrong, like, there were, if, if God had not made a rule for Adam and Eve to follow, they wouldn't have had a rule to break, right? Mm -hmm. But then they also would have been 
robots. They would not have been choosing to follow after God, right? Mm -hmm. So in order for us to choose to follow after God, there has to be a choice that takes us away from God, right? Mm -hmm. So we need the law to show us that we can choose not to follow, mm -hmm. right? And so if, if there is no law, sin's dead, but we understand that without that, we aren't really choosing God. He's, he's making it a... Uh, a, a He's, 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 not, he's not drawing us. He's forcing us. Mm -hmm. And God's a gentleman. He's mm -hmm. not going to force us into anything. And he wants, he wants that loving, reciprocal relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that's kind of a big deal. That's always been a big deal for me to understand that. Mm -hmm. So on to verse um, 19, or I mean, sorry, 9. Uh, once, once I was alive apart from the law, but when the... Con commandment came sin sprang to life and i died um that that word there for i is what we would pronounce ego is that greek word um but it seems to refer typically to the universal human experience um so once again in even in the language they're explaining you know paul's explaining that it's this um universal human experience when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. Um, so what they kind of thought about was this, this first awareness of the law's ability to determine his relation to God and his um, fellow humans. So that's kind of their thought pattern that they thought that may maybe Paul was leading us through, um, the first awareness of law's ability to determine his relation to God and his fellow humans. Um, and there in verse 10 as well, that, that I is that, that ego, um, which is that universal human experience. Um, I found that the, the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually, uh, brought death. Um, and there is said in the commentary the law can only diagnose sin as such it is incapable of curing the problem if commandments referred to the mosaic law paul is challenging the jewish assumption that the law would bring life and that's um back in leviticus 18 5 and i have that one um marked because back in leviticus 18 5 it said Keep my decrees and laws, um, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. And so, like, we're thinking if Paul, if Paul's saying this this way, if he's saying it to the Mosaic law, he's really kind of challenging this thought pattern um, that the Jews had on that the law, you know, brought life. Yeah. And it's still a thing we're trapped in today. If, if, mm -hmm. If I, I know people that, you know, were raised with some church knowledge, right? They, they grew up learning some things. And it's like, if I can just follow the things that I learned when I was a kid, I'll be fine. I'm going to, you know, this is what, and they end up, they probably learned, they, it was, a lot of things have been learned wrong or um, they've, they've misconstrued it over the years or they've heard different folk theologies that just, uh, just don't work according to the word of God. And so we get into this thing where like, uh, the law or this thing I believe about the Bible, if I will just follow that thing, I will have life or eternal life or however you want to look at that. It bring, The law brings life. But the reality is it's the law that only makes us aware of our need of something greater than the law, which we know to be Jesus Christ. And the Jews, some Jews picked up on that during the life of Jesus on earth, and others still to this day do not. Uh, we need something greater than the law to actually bring that life that the law makes us aware that we don't have mm -hmm. that so I, that leviticus passage is good i really think as we understand it through the lens of jesus mm -hmm. the law does bring life because it shows us that we need jesus mm -hmm. and jesus is the the ultimate life giver right so. right um so then on through uh verse 11 for sin seizing the opportunity afforded me um afforded by the commandment deceived me and through the commandment put me to death um so 
it said in the commentary that Paul's success in law keeping, um, not his failure to do so, led to deadly results. Kind of, you know, maybe going back to that, that Paul, you know, mm, he was trying to be kind of maybe better than, mm -hmm. in, than the rest of them. Um, it was his success at law keeping not his failure that led to the deadly results, just simply because he had made it into something that it, it wasn't supposed to be in the, from the beginning, mm. a competition. Yeah, you make it into something that's not supposed to be, or you think of yourself high, more highly than you ought, to, to use a phrase from the Bible. Um, we, if, if we think that it's just about keeping the law, then we think we're good. And, and the reality is, the Bible teaches us, I think, I think it's here in Romans, it says... Um, that if you if you break one of the commands, you're a lawbreaker. Mm -hmm. Like so, just you you can do your best to keep as many laws as possible. But if you're gonna if you fail one time, you're guilty of breaking all of it, and you still need Jesus. And so it's your failures that show that to you. It's your failures that show you that you need Jesus. And if you never see failure um, in your in your in your attempt to follow the law, man, what do you need Jesus for? And the reality is, it will be a deadly result as far as a life separated from God for eternity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in saying this, you know, because Paul seems like he's kind of coming down on the law, so he kind of, um, you know, picks that up again, 12, uh, in verse tw 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Um Having said all these things about the law, Paul immediately absolves the law of any responsibilities for human sin. Uh, the law in the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Yeah, I mean, it just is where the, the law is necessary. Because, again, without the law, we don't know that we need a Savior. Mm -hmm. And so we're not choosing God. And so the the law kind of draws that line in the sand of, are you going to follow God or are you going to follow your own desires, right? And again, it's following the law in and of itself doesn't save you. But realizing where you fall short of the law, because we all fall short of the law, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So that law is not there for us to measure our perfection by. The law is there to show where we fall short of the standard of Jesus Christ, realizing that we need the relationship of Jesus Christ to put us in good standing with God, righteous standing with God. So, finishing up there in verse 13, did that which was good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Um, and I have written there, despite law's good intentions, uh, though through sin it became an instrument of death. Paul is not equating the law with sin and death. So that's not an equation. He's not equating it with sin and death. Um, the law did not become death for me, but sin did. Ba basically, that's kind of what he's saying um, in that. Um, and then I had this other... Um, this other quote from Great House, it says, Sin shows how utterly sinful it is by its ability to pervert even the best of inten intentions into disastrous results. I think, um, so again, the idea, you know, it's not the law that has brought death, right? Mm -hmm. The law reveals sin, and we need to die to sin, so we, we're dying to the law. We're seeing the standard, saying, "Man, I can't reach that standard, so I'm gonna die to that and focus on my relationship with Jesus Christ." And in focusing on our relationship with Jesus Christ, He helps us then follow the law mm -hmm. according to how He wants us to, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it's not perfectionism, it's not legalism, it's it's just having that relationship with Jesus Christ. And we start to find ourselves, amazingly enough, uh, instead of doing what's utterly sinful, instead of taking these things that could be good in perverting them we're taking these things that that are good and we're keeping them good we're having a a right mindset towards it. that's what following jesus is having that relationship with jesus is all about because i can try to man physically follow every law that's there it's impossible we've learned that 
but if I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, he changes my mind, transforms my mind so that I can see the good that's in front of me and continue to do that, right? And say no to what is contrary to the law rather than just giving in to my own sinful desires. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's um, basically all I, I had there written down. Um, and so... I know we've kind of tried to leave everybody with um, kind of a challenge thought or question through the week. Um, and I don't know. I mean, do we, do you have a, a thought as far as that goes? Um, I think for me it goes back to that, the, the discussion of the I. Mm -hmm. So placing yourself in this, in this story, in, in, in Paul's experience, can you put yourself in here as well? Um, I'm trying to think where I have one. So verse 9, once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment sprang, or when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. Have you died because of sin? Have you allowed yourself to be transformed by your knowledge of your sinfulness so that you can say, I don't want that anymore. I'm going to die to that so that I can actually follow after Jesus. Or are you finding yourself continuing on in that sin? Or jumping from sin to sin, like, man, I got, my, I got my fix on that one, but now there's this other thing that I'm, I'm stuck with. Now there's another thing I'm stuck with. Or are you literally able to say, that is sin. Can you die to that, recognize sin as sin because it's contrary to the law, and say, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ? For me, that's the challenge. Like, so can you put yourself in this story and say, because of the law, I see sin for what it is, and I'm going to say no to it. I'm going to die to that sin so that I can follow after Jesus Christ. Because mm -hmm. that's, if you can't do that, if you're unwilling to do that, you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. It's those who are willing to say no to sin that are able to be alive in Jesus Christ. And that goes back to the first part of chapter 7. If you are going to be bound by your first husband, and we're all, all of us have the same first husband, sin nature. And so if you're not willing to say no to that, to, to be dead to that, so that you can be alive with Christ, you will continue to be bound by that sin. Even if you think you've added Jesus to your life. If you're not dead to sin, you are not alive in Christ Jesus. Harsh way to end, but I mm -hmm. think it's, I think it's uh, accurate. Um, I think it's what Paul's, Paul's leaving us with. And we get on to some good stuff next week, so you just have to tune back in then. Yeah. That's right. Should we close in prayer? All right. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for this day. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. I pray that you would speak to each person's heart as they watch this, um, as they process this and read more and more out of your word, Father God. And I pray that you would just continue to lead us on in the path that you would have us to go, to say no to sin and yes to Jesus every opportunity we have. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, coming up tomorrow night, uh, this video that we're recording right now on Tuesday will be available. So Wednesday night available for, uh, we're going to start this over because I don't know why I'm talking about that. That's just dumb. Okay. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> Try again. All right. All right, everybody.